So this morning, I get the privilege of kicking off a new series for this fall. So over the next number of weeks, basically all the way up until Advent, we are going to be doing um, a, a sermon series that notionally is on outreach, but it's on living out one's faith and being able to share the gospel with those who are in our community, in our lives, in our neighborhood. So as you, you will know, in a couple weeks, we have this neighborhood party. Great. I'm excited. I'm excited for, it is really a, a fantastic event. But I know that the notion of outreach, even the word saying that, can cause a little bit of fear, a little bit of queasiness, as it were. The, the, servant, the, the series that we're doing is really meant to both, be, I would say, diminish those fears and kind of, I would say, help to right-size our place within that process, but also, too, to equip you. And so we have two weeks now, kind of in advance of this, where we're going to focus on what does that look like to be proactive and intentional outward. But also, th then the second half of the series, which is a bit longer, is answering some of those big, key, juicy questions about, like, who is this Jesus guy? And was he real? And what is the purpose of faith in my life? And other kind of more, well, so we'll call them uh, apologetic-like questions, but it really is unpacking those to be able to allow you to have the tools, knowledge, and information to when you're engaging that there is a higher degree of comfort. The message is more about attitude and actions, and we're going to start off today with neighboring. I have to say, I'm actually really excited for this message. Neighboring is something that I have, a topic that I have l tried to live out in various phases and stages of my life. It is something that I've done a quite a bit of reading on over the years. It is something that I think is fundamental to one's Christian walk. And frankly, I think it's actually really close to the heart of God. The notion of going out, of neighboring, to being in neighborhood is so intrinsically tied with the character of God God's relationship with the world, Jesus' own ministry, Jesus' disciples, the history of the church. This is so fundamentally rooted in terms of who, of the Christian faith, the essence of God, but also in terms of what it means to walk out our faith on a day-to-day -day basis. So, as you will know, the Great Commission, yeah, I imagine most of you would be, it's talked about in all four Gospels, they highlight different things I'll share with you, it's talked about in Acts, so it's kind of a big deal. Everybody knows that it's there, it's kind of a big thing. Matthew talks about going into all the world to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I command. Mark, a little bit of a tweak. Go into all of the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Quite a different take. Luke talks about that the Messiah will suffer and raise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in the name beginning in Jerusalem. You are my witnesses in these things. So a bit of a less direct approach of like thou shalt. Um, and Acts, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses, telling people about me in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. In short, disciples, and by extension, me, and you and everybody else who proclaims to be a follower of Jesus Christ 
has this responsibility, but I'll say also the privilege of being able to be sent out in the power of the Holy Spirit to be Christ's witness to all nations, including Beacon Hill, and to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to make disciples. The call, in short, and this is kind of where I think we're going for this, or what, I, what I really hope is going to be what you, your big takeaway. The call of Jesus is for each of us, not just people who are in full-time ministry, not just clergy, not just those who are more spiritually inclined or more of extroverts. The call is for all of us to share about Jesus, the transformation he has had in our lives with those who God brings into our lives. This can be done individually. This can be done as a church. But this morning, what I want to tag on to this, and I hope that I, and I think that I'm going to try to weave through, is that the great commandment is basically, it's impossible to do that or completely impotent without first parking in the, first, in the great commandment. There's no great commission unless there's the great commandment. I'll say it again. There is no great commission unless there is first the great commandment. I'll just, I know most of you will know this, but I'll just remind all of us of what that is. Jesus was asked by a Pharisee trying to pigeonhole him in. He said, Jesus, what is the greatest, the greatest teaching of all? And Jesus said, you must Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is equally important, to love your neighbor as yourself. These are the, to me, these are the, essentially the two, or this is the pillar of the Great Commission. You cannot do great commission unless you first do great commandments. Having a transformed heart where God, where you truly love the Lord with all of your heart, mind, and soul. And loving your neighbor as yourself. And loving your neighbor as yourself. is out of this deep, tra deep transformation of love and forgiveness and grace in our own lives, then we're able to, the outpouring, the outflow, the overflowing, as it were, would then move out. All right. So that was the big picture. I hope you guys all got it. You guys don't know Ron. This is Kiran's Uncle Ron. As you may know, you may have heard this last weekend our family was in St. Catharines for a funeral. Um, he unexpectedly passed away uh, last Friday uh, after a five-year battle with cancer. Um, super sad. In a human terms, a really sad thing. Uh, life cut short way too early. Decades too early. You're going to miss key milestones in his kids and his grand grandkids' life. Ron, I can say, lived a life, a good life. My mother-in-law, who's here, who's known Ron much, much longer than I, can attest that Ron was a very good man. But it was interesting. During, this, during the service, they talked about Ron 1.0 and Ron 2.0. See, what happened about five, seven years ago was his first uh, diagnosis of cancer. At that point, they actually thought he was going to pass at that time. The work of the physicians and God's providence in his life gave him a lease on life. Got to enjoy his, see grandkids be born, marriages. But Ron didn't just live a good life. 
or a life well lived. I'm actually going to go as far to say that Kadin's Uncle Ron lived an exceptional life. It wasn't that he was a good guy and a good neighbor and that he inter engaged with people out walking the dog, organized community events. It wasn't that he had fun doing competitions and having nice, comp like, really friendly, like, last Thanksgiving we were down there, he turned pumpkin carving into this epic competition. It wasn't that he went to build houses in uh, El Salvador with, which are all good things. It's that after 2017-18, Ron had a wake-up call. And God got a hold of his life. There was a rearranging of priorities. Yes, he was retired, and so there's more latitude. But there was a genuine reprioritizing of his life, and that's when Ron 2.0 was born. Fr uh, uh, Friday's uh, funeral for Ron was literally an amazing event of evangelism, of people sharing the gospel, about testimony of a life well lived, about how Ron had not just a positive impact in human terms in people's lives, but that how he had been a person who actively lived out both parts of the great commission, the good great commandment. They truly loved the Lord as God with all of his heart, his mind, and his soul. He made love an action verb. But he also, too, brought peace, the shalom of God, to his relationships and to others. At the end of the funeral, the so the, they had the... the, the re, re, the visitation in a funeral home, and they had a director there, and then they had the service at their church. But the funeral director was still there helping with making arrangements. After the service, she came up to uh, Kidin's aunt, Aunt Jean, and separately to uh, one of her co cousin-laws. And she said in all of her years of being a funeral director, she had never witnessed such a celebration of life such joy, such happiness, such peace. The worship music, the testimony. She went on to say that she might just have to believe after having been there that day. And they were going to probably see her back this morning. An incredible testament to his life reaching people even beyond death. A legacy left, left will. So what does this mean for us? Can I go back to this notion of fear? And I apologize for the small text for some. What does it mean to be about the Great Commission, to be about outreach? to be about having an impact in your community. Again, there's fear, there's trepidations, nauseousness. And we like the good story of Uncle Ron, but when we, when we comes to landing the plane in our own lives, that's like a little bit intimidating. What does it mean to, in your apartment building, in your family, in your friend group? So I, I, I'm hoping that this slide in this little section here is going to help to address some of those concerns. And I think probably alleviate some of the pressure that kind of some people feel with this. The first thing I want to, you to know about this is Missio Dei. That God is a God uh, on a mission. The church doesn't have a mission on its own. Rather, the primary emphasis is on what God is already doing. In the, for redeeming the world. Second is that God is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God's mission and his character are is thoroughly triune. 
In the broadest sense, missions, outreach, started with the Father and the Holy Spirit creating the world. The Father sent the Son, sent him on a mission to earth. Then the God and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to the church to empower and to build the church. And then the triune God is sending the church into the world. And by extension, sending us. Missions is not primarily an activity of the church, but an attribute of who God is. God, our God is a missionary God. He's actively doing work. You walk out the door. God's already there. God's doing stuff in Cambodia. God is doing stuff in Iran. God is doing stuff at your aunt's house. God is doing work in your kid's school. God is, al- God is active. God is already at work. As such, is not the church that has a mission of salvation to fulfill the world. It is the mission of the Son and the Spirit through the Father that includes the church. As theologian Christopher Wright put it, fundamentally, our mission, if it is to be biblically informed and validated, means our committed participation as God's people, at God's invitation and in God's own mission within history of God's world for the redemption of God's creation. I want to just step back and say, what does that mean? Like, that's a lot of words. God's already at work. God's already doing really cool stuff. I'll give a little plug for Janet. Janet, if you regale, Janet can regale some stories afterwards of some of the amazing work that she gets to see do it going on internationally that the Lord is doing. But God is already doing it. And it's God's invitation for us to be part of that. In other words, the mission of the church cannot be reduced to a traditional sense of what missions was from the years gone by. This could be, as John Stott talked about, that social action is equally as important as traditional evangelism. Or as Leslie Newbig talks, that the Christian mission is thus to act out in the whole world, the whole life, of the whole world, the confession of the Jesus is Lord. So what, is, what, does that mean? what does that mean? What does that mean for you, for me? No, seriously, what does that mean? I'm going to put a little question, uh, thought down that what God is doing in your sphere and in the sphere of this church is very quite vastly different and then we should be about work that is vastly different than say what God is doing in Nigeria or what God is doing in California or in Mexico or in Vancouver or in Montreal or Nepean. What God is doing is very localized. So while we can draw back to like large theological tenets, what God is already doing is for us to find out what he's doing. So you'll see at the little bottom of the screen here, I'm not sure if you can see it, It's meant to be subtle. It says prayer walks. 
a number of years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Morocco. And while we were there, a missionary challenged us to, I forget which city, I think we were in Marrakesh. Just coincidental with the tragic events from yesterday. Um, he goes, oh, she challenged us and she said, you want to know what God is doing in this place? Go for a walk and pray. It's like, what do you mean? That's much more tangible. Like, we have to be about the work. No, she said, go out and pray. Go walk around the community, spend the morning praying. Go on a prayer walk. Ask God to open your eyes to see what he is already doing. Ask God to show you, to bring people into your life. So I know a number of you are walkers. Well, not, like myself, I love to go for a walk, take my dog for a walk. I'm going to challenge you with one thing in the lead up to the event in two weeks. I'm going to ask you to very intentionally go for prayer walks. I'm going to ask you, when you step out the door, when you put your shoes on or your coat on soon, hopefully not your toques, Lord, give me the eyes to see and ears to hear what you are doing or in my neighborhood. What are you doing at the street across the street? God, bring to mind those concerns and desires or hurts that are at the school. Or my neighbor down the street that is having a hard time. Stop. Pray at their house. You don't need to go up and be all awkward and be like, hey, I'm praying for you. Like, just but stop and pray. Actively pray. Just don't think about something. Think a good thought. No. Be engaged in the discipline of prayer. Walk down your street. Ask God, what is God doing on Appleford? God, show me, what is it you're doing? Where can I partner with you? What can I do on Kinder? What can I do on East Acres? What are you already up to here? And how can I partner with you? And sometimes it'll just be a, th a, no a notional thing. It'll be like feeling like there's a, a hurt that is going on or a joy that's going on, or a brokenness, or a pain, or a celebration, and pray into those things. But I my encouragement to you this morning, go for a prayer walk. For those of you who live on Jasmine, walk down Jasmine. Walk around the towers. Go down Aerosmith. second thing I'm going to talk to you about this morning is neighboring in a post-Christian world. Given its context and location, when I think about what is the vision for Pine Grove, this is me not wearing elder hat, this is just Wes, just please, let's park that. When I think about what is the, what is the vision for this place? I often come back to some version of this. Is that everyone in Beacon Hill knows somebody who authentically lives out the Great Commandment. My vision, again, I'll, I'll repeat it because I think I don't want to lose, is that everybody in Beacon Hill knows somebody who authentically lives out the great commandment. So, when I looked at the last census data, that's about 10,000, 12,000 people that live in Beacon Hill. That means there's a lot of work to be, to be done. There's a lot of people who need to know to have, who are living out the great commandment, who are disciples, who love Jesus, who want to see Jesus. I think that is a great vision. To be honest, I think I would love to know that everybody 
all the houses, everybody who lives in the houses on the East Acres, we'll start there, knows somebody who was authentically living out the Great Commandment. Can you imagine how different our community would be? Seriously. If you had everybody here knowing somebody who was authentically living out the Great Commandment, how different would the community look? When that person's in crisis, they know they can go to, the, to Chris and get prayer. They can see Shannon, and she brings them a, a, some cookies on a, on, a, on a tough day. The Cherie is there to give a warm hug, a w- word of encouragement. Can you seriously imagine what our community, Beacon Hill, would look like if everybody knew somebody who authentically lived out the Great Commission or the Great Commandment? I gotta say that's a really chal- challenge. We went to a, a, a wedding this summer here, and it was interesting talking to some of the young adults that were there. They'd never been to a wedding before. Totally ir- irreligious. Never been set foot in a church before. Like we live in a very different context than even say twenty years ago, where, like, it was forty years ago was like years and eons ago. We are re-evangelizing. It sounds like such, almost like too old, but it's reintroducing Jesus to a whole generation, to a whole nation. So then, what does that look like? Like, what does that mean to physically, actively do that in church? There's this church down in Portland, Oregon that I peer at from time to time on see what they're up to. And their uh, pastor had something to the effect of, we want to be so vital in our community, to the community around us, that if ever our doors close, the entire neighborhood would be upset. They want to be so useful, not just in preaching the good news, but they recognize that in their context, which is a fairly socially liberal, Portland is a, would say a very liberal town. <laughs> they recognize that they need to be about meeting the needs and partnering with their community. So Jesus definitely invited people to say, come, when he's invited people to say, come, follow me. He met their physical needs. He met their emotional needs. He also met their spiritual needs. He didn't just invite people to come listen to him at the synagogue to preach, right? He definitely did that. But he was out beyond the walls of the synagogue in the community, tangibly meeting the needs of people. Bringing shalom bringing the peace of God to people's lives and to some complex situations. So my question this morning is a bit controversial, or at least I, I don't intend it to be controversial, but I do intend it to be to cause a reaction. And this is for all of us. And so I've been wrestling with this for a few days. Over the last, I would say, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I've, in my time in this church at least, I've seen a natural progression of the church moving from being kind of a commuter-oriented church where people were living in disparate parts of the greater Ottawa area to a much more locally engaged church. And I look at even just the attendance here this morning, and there's a lot more people who I could probably throw a football and hit your house. Actually, no, I'm just joking. I don't throw that far. (laughs) But there's a much more of a locally engaged community. 
which I, th to be honest, I think that's wonderful. But if Pine Grove closes its doors tomorrow, would the community of Beacon Hill be upset? Would it even notice? Would it care? That is, I think, a good key performance indicator of whether the church is on mission and being about God's mission. Would anyone care? Outside of the people, of course, that are here. Like, I know you guys will care. But would the people across the street care? Would the people who live locally, would, would, your, would your physically your next door neighbor care? Would our neighbors right here care? I'm sure some developer would love it, like great property, build some condos, put in a nursing home, whatever. Someone would love that, great land. But would the neighborhood care? Would the community care? Would the community be at loss? And if in your mind your honest answer is no, then great. We've got work to do. There's a little event coming up in two weeks that and th listen, this is, th this is a one-off event. It's not uh, serve some hot dogs, some bouncy castle, some music. That's not sustaining. But what maybe it looks like is that we look at our, we, we look at our community, and not d actually di much different from a model, say, the food for the hungry, where you look at what does our community actually need. Do an inventory of like what are the physical, what are the actual needs of our community. I can tell you, looking at the census data, our community, Beacon Hill, particularly the south side of Beacon Hill, has a per disproportionately high number of single moms, a disproportionately number high number of lower income people. So, what does that look like to meet food insecurity needs, to address issues related to Educational needs, where there's like almost no affordable tutoring. Our church here has a disproportionately high number of people who are teachers, people with graduate degrees, and particularly in STEM, which is really weird for a church, science, technology, engineering, and math. We have a really high, disproportionately high number of people with STEM degrees here. So what, is the, what does that need look like in our community and how can our resources, our gifts, our abilities better mesh with our community so that when we ask this question, say, in two years' time, that your immediate answer is yes. that we are so vital to our community that those around us would be upset if the doors ever closed. So I'm going to land the plane because I probably am well over time. So I'm just going to... So what does it mean to love our neighbor, to be neighboring, as I call it, the verb? I turned neighboring neighborhood into a verb. What does it mean to neighbor? I grew up in Calgary, as I think some of you knew. I had the privilege of being part of a Christian ministry when I was a high school kid called Young Life. Some of you may have heard of it. One of their foundational tenets, uh, philosophical underpinnings, is kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. 
Kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's a powerful approach that, frankly, I think is pretty wise for us corporately as a church, but also individually to own. From my experience in full-time ministry and various different spheres of my life, the two characteristics that I've seen repeatedly of people who live out the great commandments are this. They are people who authentically love their neighbors, who are just like in love their neighbors. Now, again, I'm not talking about introverts and extroverts because it's like it's really independent of kind of how God's hardwired your brain. But they really just genuinely love their neighbors. To be honest, I find introverts, uh, being married to an introvert, I find them, Kim and other introverts are way more perceptive than the extrovert um, about what's going on. But it's loving, it's that choice to choose to love your neighbor as yourself. Again, the person who lives in the apartment next to you or your next door neighbor or your neighbor down the street. They also too bring the peace of God, the shalom of God. It's not chaos and it's not, they're not a, it's just not this air of chaos. Like hard times happen, like I, preached a few weeks ago. We go through seasons in our lives where there are hard things. But there is that peace from God, that shalom from God, that is generally present in their lives. So who is my neighbor? So who is your neighbor? Small business owner, this is great Lebanese family that just opened a shawarma shop over here in the plaza. That'd be the church's neighbor. Staff that work at McDonald's, definitely our neighbors. Our city councilor, Tim Tierney, 100% our neighbor. He's actually a neighbor of you guys. It's the teacher, the child care provider, the stay-at-home mom, the Uber driver, the Amazon delivery guy, the drug dealer, the sex worker, the single mom, the refugee, the new Canadian, the international student. Whether it is the young, whether it is the old, the kind person, the old curmudgeon, the hurt, the wounded, the addicted, the person just learning to speak English, they are all our neighbor. And God has commanded us to love them as we love ourselves. But I'm going to go back to Uncle Ron. Uncle Ron, what in Ron 2.0. Uncle Ron wasn't a, the, the call to love wasn't a passive verb in his life. It was an active verb born out of knowing that he is truly redeemed and that he is truly loved. And out of that personal, deep, intimate relationship with God, he was able then to love actively love, or as Bob Goff called it, to do love, or love does. Love does, sorry. Love does. Love takes action. It's not about checking the right answers, though we'll get into some of those answers part of this series. It's not about checking boxes. It is shamelessly to show love and grace to those who are around us. Our mission is to find a way with our gifts, abilities, time, limitations to love everyone without fear of who they are or, frankly, who they love. 
Bogdanoff in his book called Everybody Always says, we don't need to spend as much time. Ah, it's on the screen. Thank you. We don't need to spend as much time as we do telling people what we think about what they are doing. Loving people doesn't mean we need to control their conduct. I'll give some caveat. This is maybe doesn't always apply to parenting. There's a big difference between the two. Loving people means caring without an agenda. As, as soon as we have an agenda, it's not love anymore. It's acting like we care to get someone to do what we want and what we think God wants them to do. Do less of that, and people will see a lot less of you and more of Jesus. I'm going to finish with this. It's from Colossians 3. You're welcome to open up your scriptures. It's Colossians 3, 12, 17. Because I'm like, what does this look like in real terms? And I get this context is really written for relationships within the church, but I think this equally applies to relationships outside of the church. And frankly, as Romans 12 talks about living at peace with everyone. Romans 3, 12 to 17, and I'll finish with this. Therefore, as God's people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. See, those all apply out, outside the church too, right? Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has grievance against someone, forgive, especially that curmudgeon neighbor of yours. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. In all of these virtues, put on love. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body you are called to peace. And if you convert it from Greek to shalom, you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing with gratitude, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord, Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him.